Welcome everyone to our August 2023 session of AZ Bio Peers. And we are thrilled today to um, expand knowledge by sharing with members of the community, by members of the community here in Arizona on the things that help grow great bioscience companies. Um, with that, I would like to introduce you to Dylan today. Dylan is um, our newest. Um, PhD team member at AZ Bio. Congratulations, Dylan. Um, he um, will tell you a little bit about what he got his PhD in as he introduces our program today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dylan. And here we go. Thank you, Joan. And thank you, everyone, for being here. So I'm Dylan PA. Uh, my research focus was in behavioral neuroscience. I researched uh, how stress and uh, different hormones impact the brain and use it as a model for depression. And today I'm going to be introducing Adrian Pearson. Adrian is an environmental uh, health and safety specialist and owner of EHS. And we're going to get to learn a lot about the importance of environmental health and safety and really when we should really be considering these things with our companies. Thank you, Adrian. Excellent. Thank you, Dylan. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here, Joan and Dylan and AZ Bio. Really excited to be here. I've got a lot of content to cover, and I'm just so excited to have the opportunity to just be here in front of you. As Dylan mentioned, I'm Adrian Pearson, and I am the owner of Evolving EHS. I have been doing environmental health and safety for, whew, gosh, more than a decade now. It's been a fun journey and, you know, it's been interesting because when I first started my career, I came home to my husband and I said, babe, guess what? And he's like, what? And I said, I'm going to save the planet. And he looked at me and he said, okay, honey, I support you 100%. You have at it. And the funniest thing about that is at the time, he was an automotive painter. So his industry was sort of polluting the environment. And here I come along saying, I am going to save the planet. And I was very excited too. And early on in my career, when I had the opportunity to step into health and safety, that the second and third portion of my career, I took it. And little did I know back then that it really fulfilled my need for helping people and my passion for helping people. And so often what I find is a lot of people don't understand how occupational environmental health and safety really affect them in their work or their organization as well. But it's not always about work, okay? When I'm not doing health and safety and environmental work stuff, I do like to go hiking. Um, I'm teaching myself how to play the ukulele. And one of these days, hopefully I'll sing and play in front of an audience. So with that, I'll get started. Most of the time when I introduce myself, people ask me, hey, Adrian, what is it that you do? And I say, oh, I help organizations with their occupational environmental health and safety. And half of them look at me like I have a horn coming out of the middle of my forehead because they get lost when I say occupational environmental health. And then when I get to safety, they're like, oh, okay. I know what you do now. Okay, safety, which is good. So at least a lot, some people or a majority of people have that concept of safety, but they don't grasp the health and environmental part of their organization. So I put this presentation together for AZ Bio, but also for an audience that's more in the beginning phases of their occupational environmental health and safety program. And hopefully for those who are a little bit further along, you'll stick around and you're be able to get a nugget or two from this presentation. But one of the things that I'd really like to focus on and help really understand and help you understand is how does it apply to your organization and your business? So really grasp the relevancy of a program to your business, okay? And then I'll wrap up with some tips and implementations on how to implement your program or start your program. Again, I, my goal is to have you take your learnings from what you find and learn here today and then apply it to your own business and your own program, okay? 
So I'm going to start off with defining what occupational environmental health and safety. You can't really implement something unless you begin to define it or really understand what it is. So people get lost again with the occupational piece of it. And that really is just what's your occupation? What is the occupation of either your particular job or your employee's job within your organization. So that's all that occupational means. It's just, it's the job, it's the task, okay? Environmental. Oftentimes when we think about environmental, we think about, you know, the air outside or the land outside or the water outside, which are all true. Yes, that's immediately where our minds begin to go to. But also, keep in mind that within our organizations and within your business as well, there's an environment that workers are in as well. Just like your home, your home is your own environment. Your business and your place of occupation is also an environment as well. So I put two different definitions of environmental here to sort of help you grasp that concept of it's not only just the outside, but it's also within the organization as well. You know, and health. Health is one of those where we think immediately just our body, like our physical bodies, which again, it's fine, but we're starting to see a lot of attention and a lot of awareness towards well-being and mental health as well. So there's a lot of organizations and a lot of programs out there that are really focusing on the mental health side and the well-being of their employees, okay? And then there's safety, right? Again, we think about that that physical aspect of the human body, again, which is fine, um, but think about it from the perspective of, is your work environment a safe and healthy place for your employees to speak up and voice their suggestions of implementation or their ideas about certain things within the process or your process within your organization? Is it a safe place for them to speak up and voice their accomplishments okay, or their concerns? All right. So another way to really think about environment, health and safety is like this blending of all of them encompassing together. And Quite a while ago, it used to be where a lot of organizations had environmental health and safety as sort of separate, which was fine. Uh, but we're really starting to see that blending. You know, back way back when there would be a lot of folks who would say, Yeah, yeah, that's the environmental people. You got to go talk to the environmental people. Or they would say, Yep, those are the industrial hygienists. You got you got to go talk to the health and, and industrial hygienist people. But now it's really that blending of all of it together. And there are really different categories as too, okay? And so your program, your occupational environmental health and safety program is really a written plan that outlines what you're doing as a company with respect to occupational environmental health and safety. Okay, so it's really important that what you say you're doing, you're actually implementing it and doing it out on the floor or out on um, the work environment, okay? So it's also not only a plan and your organization's plan of what you're doing, it can also align with your business continuity plan. You know, that's another big area where a lot of focus and attention is popping up. Um, your business occupation or excuse me, your your business continuity plan, you know, your occupational environmental health and safety plan could align with that. All right. Or even be implemented in that. And for those who don't know what that plan is, it's really just a plan to help you plan for when crisis strikes. Right. We just got done with a global pandemic you know, supply chain issues are happening all over the place, or especially during the, the pandemic, right? So it's a plan for where you protect your assets and you allow them to function quickly or even get up and going when disaster strikes, okay? Another way to think about it 
is your plan is really just based on what is it that you do as a business? What are the tasks that need to transpire to do what you do as a business? And then what are the employees exposed to during doing those tasks? Okay. And oftentimes what I find is a lot of employees come from different organizations, right? They come with a different experience and they're coming with some sort of knowledge base or experience within a different organization that has an, a plan already in place, okay? So keep that in mind as you're developing your plan or as you're updating your plan. Your written plan should be available to employees, readily available to them, and it should be updated and reviewed periodically. It should reflect exactly what you're doing as a business. As you add new things to your business or subtract things, your plan should really reflect that as well, okay? And again, what I've often find in my experience is when an organization has a plan in place and is implementing that plan, they're able to help retain top talent a bit better because that's communicating to potential employees, hey, we know what these hazards are that you're exposed to. We're on top of figuring out how to protect you from those hazards. And we have a plan in place for when your exposure to that hazard or whatever it is within your job. So it really is just an organization. It really helps drive that you're being pretty organized with having your written plan. Okay. So there's various elements to an occupational environment to health and safety plan. This is not an all encompassing list. Okay. So I pulled some of these elements of what a program should look like based on who I thought was mostly going to be on this call. And I'm suspecting a lot of folks here on this call are in uh, their startups, their small businesses, they're in research laboratory um, settings. So again, it's not an all encompassing, but it's a starting point to get you to grasp what should be in, in your written plan. And starting with injury and illness. If an employee is injured, what do they do? Who do they go to? Who do they report that to? Where do they go if they need medical attention? And one other thing I should mention about your written plan is not only should it reflect on what you do, but it also should outline and specify who's responsible for doing what within your organization as it comes to health and safety. So your plan should spell out if an employee is injured, who do they report that to and where do they go to get medical attention? Okay, so most of you who are in R&D or laboratory settings, you do need to have a chemical hygiene plan. Really what that plan is really focused on are the hazardous chemicals that are needed to do your, your business or whatever project you're working on, okay? So even those who aren't in a laboratory setting, but you still have chemicals that you need for whatever plethora of reasons, you still need to have some sort of chemical management. You know, employees have the right to know what chemicals they are exposed to. And within that, they need to be able to know exactly where safety data sheets, way back when they used to be called MSDSs, material safety data sheets, but now they're called safety data sheets. And so every chemical should come with a safety data sheet and those should be readily available to employees as well, okay? Heat and heat illness, injury and prevention. This is a big one that's on the horizon. And in fact, OSHA is getting ready to establish some uh, federal standards on a heat in illness and injury. And it's not only, they're not only looking at it from an outdoor perspective, but they're also looking at it from an indoor perspective. And I'm mentioning that here because there are some organizations that maybe have a, a clean room of some sort or some area where employees need to suit up, okay? And they need to wear a certain attire to enter that room, which is fine. 
But keep in mind what happens when that AC or your HVAC system is not working properly or it goes down. Okay, so having an awareness of heat illness symptoms is drastically important in understanding what do you do in that situation or how do we approach that when our employees are exposed to heat illness symptoms okay machine guarding and lockout tag out a lot of people don't think that that really applies to them in a laboratory setting but believe it or not there are some machines and equipment out there that do expose employees to like rotating parts or any any weird gears or some sort and especially if employees are needing to like i call it get into the machine if they need to get into it somehow to do some sort of maintenance or whatnot maybe not your employees or what about the facility folks who maintain your your uh, buildings of some sort unfortunately machine guarding and lockout tag out still tends to be within the top 10 OSHA site violations. So OSHA puts out a top 10 citations of which standards are mostly cited and machine guarding and lockout tagout tend to be still within the top 10. Lockout tagout is, a, both of them sort of go hand in hand, machine guarding and lockout tagout. And with lockout tagout, depending on the equipment, in the machine itself, uh, some of them do need to have written specific procedures on what to do when they're locking it out and tagging it out. Okay. Ladder usage. A lot of people seem to think, okay, ladders are just in the construction industry, which is true, but are ladders needed to complete tasks or to grab something over there that is stored way up high on a shelf or whatnot? Uh, we still have see fatalities from ladder usage, believe it or not. Uh, personal protective equipment, you know, are those chemicals that you're using or mixing together, do they need nitro gloves or do they need some sort of respiratory uh, protection, okay? An emergency evacuation and response. This is a big one. Unfortunately, we are living in a society where disgruntled people are coming back to workplace and, and causing workplace violence. We, we hear this all the time in hospital settings. Um, another place are, you know, unfortunately people are just coming back and seeing that the workplace violence is just increasing, okay? Interesting enough, when you're thinking about your emergency evacuation response for your own facility, think about it not only for your facility, but your neighbors too. In fact, I had an experience early on in my career where I was working with a small mom and pop shop. It was a manufacturing company and they were located within a light industrial area, okay? The company did not have a health and safety plan at the time and we were in the process of updating it and getting it established. What happened was one day I'm sitting at my desk and my phone rings and so I answer it and it literally sounded like a robot on the other end of the phone and they said you need to evacuate your building and of course it was choppy and whatnot and I kind of looked at the phone and I thought oh my gosh what this is this is not real so I literally hung up the phone and just went about my day. 30 seconds later, I had multiple people coming into my office saying, Adrian, what do we do? What do we do? And I'm saying, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, we got this phone call. And lo and behold, that's when it started clicking. Yep, okay, we need to evacuate um, uh, our building quickly. And fortunately, this was happening during the lunch hour. So not all employees were at work. Some of them were off site because they were out to having lunch. And what ended up happening was, one of our neighbors within a mile radius it was a recycling place they had uh, punctured a 55 gallon drum that wasn't labeled and the person who was running like the claw of some sort whatever they were doing to move it um, once they punctured that 55 gallon drum they immediately um, died and so emergency so um firefighters and the fire department what their emergency plan is because they don't know what the substance is and the person who was operating the crane died somebody on the site came rushing because they saw the person operating the crane they too ended up getting severely um at some severe illness so the their process was to evacuate within a five mile radius 
So it's something to just keep in mind as you're putting together your emergency evacuation. It's not only just for what do you do when you need to evacuate your own building, but what happens and what do you do? What's your plan in place when your neighbors are in the same boat and you need to evacuate your building there? Some other things to keep in mind are on the environmental side. Okay, so do you need some air permits? Are you emitting certain things or certain chemicals out into the air that might need an air permit, either a Title V or a non-Title V air permit, okay? Disposal, okay, not only just regular garbage, all right? Are there things that within your process that are classified as hazardous waste that you need to take off site and transport it to a facility that's permitted to take your hazardous waste? Okay, some other things to keep in mind with disposal is do you have computers or batteries or any sort of electronics that you're no longer using anymore? What about your facility in their fluorescent lighting? Okay, do those get changed out? Like these are some of those things that would need to be part of your disposal. Okay, spill prevention that's another big one, especially if you're having, if you've got some chemicals, you get some floor drains within the space that um, your building has or the space where the tasks are being taken care of. Um, in fact, one time one of our sites had a hydraulic oil leak with it from one of their machines that they were using within their clean room. And unfortunately, they didn't know that the machine was leaking. And so they left for the day and came back and several gallons of hydraulic oil was all over the floor and also going into um, the floor drain. Well, at the time, nobody really paid attention on if where that floor drain one, if they had a floor drain and two, where that floor drain went. So unfortunately, uh, they also had to uh, work with their local uh, wastewater treatment plant as well and um, kind of work through that. But my point is they were able to have clean up the spill as quickly as they could because they were they had materials on site. OK, another thing to keep in mind, too, is do you have vendors coming and going on your site as well? In fact, um, we had an experience where one of our vendors came on site. They didn't realize when they were coming onto our site that they had punctured their diesel fuel tank. So as they came on site, were delivering their materials to us, um, their diesel fuel was leaking right on our site. And again, at this point, nobody knew that there were uh, dry wells within their parking lot. So. Um, they were scrambling quickly to try to clean up because they weren't prepared on a spill outside of their facility. Okay. Stormwater. Stormwater is another one. We don't get a lot of rain here, although we do sometimes when it does. Wow, it really rains here. So stormwater is the concept of, you know, what is floating and stormwater outside. Okay. So your parking lots, your roofs, things like that. Are you storing chemicals outside? that are uncovered? Or are you storing maybe some hazardous waste outside too or garbage outside as well, okay? So having a stormwater plan in place for your site as well is pretty important. I put shipping hazardous materials and dangerous goods. Uh, there are three modes of shipping when it comes to shipping, okay? There's um, roads and highways, okay? That's a normal, that's a that's a typical way of transporting either hazardous materials, hazardous waste. Uh, there's also air, okay? So airplane, and then there's maritime or boat, all right? Uh, I've seen a lot of places where if they have one facility in one state, they have another facility in another state, um, they're trying to save money. So one facility in one state will purchase a chemical or something, realize, oh, I don't need it or I'm done using it, but their other facility in a different state need it, so they'll just go ahead and ship it. And of course, typically, it always ends up being, well, I have to get it there within two days. So that tends to be air, okay? So think, keep in mind, of are you shipping things with batteries, equipment with batteries? And, and you would be surprised on how many things classify as either a hazardous material or dangerous goods. Uh, dangerous goods is really more for air, so second day air. 
um, or excuse me, not just second day, second day air, but just airplane in general. And things can still be shipped on passenger airplanes as well as cargo airplanes too, okay? Main reason why having an EHS written program is important because firefighting is pretty stressful, okay? Having a plan in place and having an implementation in place is really going to help things move along smoother and keep that reactionary down. Okay, so let's talk about costs a little bit. There's two types of costs that we typically look at. And in my world, we've got our direct costs and then we have our indirect costs. And our direct costs are just that, you know, costs of injuries and illness or your insurances and uh, workers' compensation or maybe there was damage to your facility or tools or equipment and the cost of replacing those. Okay, so those are those direct costs that are pretty prevalent in, in you needing to pay upfront, okay? So indirect costs are some of those that are a little bit more camouflaged, all right? And I put time because I haven't found a really good, clean way of capturing time, but also time is one of those that not only is it a commodity, but it's really hard to grasp how much time does it take to do something. I often pick on Bubba and Dottie, so my apologies if there is a Dottie or a Bubba here, but early on in my career, and I was working with Dottie, loved working with Dottie. She was a sweet gal, new in her career. She was an admin assistant, and she was very excited about her job and really just wanted to do a good job. And one day, one of her tasks was really to enter a lot of data into systems, right? Into either an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of system that the organization had that was collecting data. and what ended up happening was the system that was in place was very manual. So what they would do is they would print out forms or whatnot for people to fill out, okay, written by hand. And if you didn't get it to Dottie in time, well, then it sort of stacked up. And one day she got about 12 of these reports that she had to enter in. And I asked her, hey, Dottie, what how long does it take you to enter all the information, like one of these reports into this? And she was like, well, maybe about 10 minutes. And I thought, okay, 10 minutes. Tell me why it takes about 10 minutes to enter this one report into this data. And so she was explaining to me, one, it's really hard to read people's handwritings. Two, she might have to go track someone down ask them what did they mean or clarify something um, and three it was just a lot of manual labor and so it took her two hours to enter 12 reports and i thought wow two hours just to enter 12 reports and that's just an example of sometimes we just don't grasp how long something takes or we have a really good idea in implementing something Right, but we're not thinking about well, how long does it actually take somebody to enter all this information? Um, your reputation is another one, okay, as a business or even just as an organization, there can be repercussions for negative um, impact to your reputation, uh, lost production training, especially if somebody has been injured. You know, it takes a lot of time to retrain someone or get somebody to on board that was replacing somebody who's injured or is out on um, days away because of an injury, investigating that incident of an injury. Again, that takes some time, okay? And employee morale can really decline. And again, these are some things that it's really hard to grasp or even capture. How do you track employee morale? Um, not only can morale kind of plummet, when injuries or illnesses happen, but employee absenteeism can be a big one too. And then what ends up happening is when employee absenteeism, when you don't have a full team, you know, 
that stretches other employees because the work's got to go somewhere else, right? That work's got to go on to somebody else's plate. And then, you know, that record keeping, again, writing and um, tracking and making sure all the information has been captured. And those, again, take some time. And, you know, unfortunately, we live in a time where, you know, social media is just readily at our veil at our fingertips. Everybody's got cameras, everybody's got phones on them. And what we're starting to see too is, um, you know, a lot of awareness coming out of injuries or fatalities. And so, uh, you know, things can happen. And when you and your organization gets negative attention from news, it begins to erode some of that trust, not only for your potential clients or your customers that you're working with, but also potential top talent too. They are paying attention to organizations. So it's really, really difficult to kind of come back and to rebuild that trust when you've been negatively impacted in the news. So let's take a little bit diver, deeper dive into some of those costs. Uh, these are estimated costs. Okay, so a lot of the information provided here has been provided from the National uh, Commercial Insurance Organization and um, over a plethora of data or workers' compensation information that has been submitted. And as an example, okay, a back strain can be anything from a twisting movements or repetitive motions or pushing or pulling. You know, somebody's grabbing that box off of off of that truck from that delivery truck, or somebody needs to grab something over here, or somebody needs to push something over there, okay? So what this is saying is, again, these are just estimated costs, but for a company who has a profit margin of 5%, you know, your direct costs are $32,000. Uh, your indirect costs can be about $35,000. And so it, it'll take you about $705,000 thousand dollars in sales to just cover your indirect costs just for one back strain okay carpal tunnel syndrome that's another one um a lot maybe some of you have been hearing the term ergonomics or even repetitive motion okay so a lot of repetitive motion can contribute to carpal tunnel syndrome a lot of people like to think carpal tunnel syndrome is really just for people who work heavily at a computer for long periods of time, but that's not always the case. There are tasks and jobs out there that require a lot of people to do just repetitive motion, depending on if it's manual labor or depending on what the task is. Um, repetitive motion is just that constant re repetitiveness of a limb of some sort okay so when it comes to carpal tunnel syndrome it's not only just somebody sitting at a computer all day it can also be in, embedded within other jobs and other tasks too and in fact i had a situation an incident where an employee uh, reported a near miss and i'll go over what that is in just a minute but they were using a piece of equipment within the lab that required it was under pressure and the nature of the project or the research required this piece of equipment to have multiple syringes so i think about 10 syringes and what the individual had to do was they had to pull the syringe all right but because it was under a type of a pressure, they really had to kind of really pull on that on that uh, syringe. And what ended up happening was based on the position, based on how frequent or how often they had to pull these syringes and the placement of the machine, uh, the individual sort of heard a pop within their wrist. Well, when you're grabbing and needing to pull something that's kind of under pressure, I could put a lot of strain on uh, bodily limbs and not only just the, like that pulling again our bodies are just not meant to be in a specific position for long periods of time okay so just again another example of what a carpal tunnel syndrome injury can cost a business and 
there's been a lot of awareness growing from uh, carpal tunnel syndrome or muscle skeletal disorders. Okay. Again, in my world, we kind of call that ergonomics and they can be um, pretty tough to identify as well. So there's a lot of attention growing in that realm. I believe a few years ago, OSHA came out or was trying to attempt an ergonomic standard, but I think due to the pandemic, they switched their agendas quickly and we know how that can go. The lacerations, okay, I've seen a lot where a lot of laboratories or even just um, different industries as well, they love to use these razor blades, right, for a plethora of reasons. Razor blades are great, they're small, they uh, they precisely cut and they are just fantastic. But what ends up happening is uh, they're really sharp, right? And oftentimes on one end of a razor, that's the part where you want to pick up. And then the other end of the razor is the razor part. So a laceration from a razor can, depending on the severity of it, um, it you know, it can cost a lot just having someone be out because of a laceration from uh, just using a razor blade. Um, I've seen a lot where uh, some razor blade usage, you know, you can get minor injuries just, you know, from your, on your finger or just a minor first aid, which is okay, you know, not okay for the person, but it is not a major uh, laceration of, of whatnot. However, it's still an injury and there still takes time to heal from that. So, one thing I wanted to present to you here was this concept of the Heinrich model, okay? So in my world, we either call it Heinrich triangle or Heinrich's 329-1 model. And the philosophy behind this is for every 300 near misses, there's 29 minor injuries per one major injury or fatality, okay? So near misses, near misses are those where how many times have you personally within your work environment had said, whew, that was close, right? But you kept that to yourself and you didn't inform someone. So the idea behind this one is this for every 300 reported near misses, there's 29 minor injuries per one major in injury. And where this model came from was Herbert Heinrich during the 30s came up with a study that resulted in this model here. And he was an assistant superintendent to the insurance company. And he was just baffled at how many major injuries were transpiring. So he did a whole study taking data that the insurances had um, collected over the years when it came to workplace injuries and came up with this model and today this model has been studied extensively over decades and they are saying that it is one of the basis this model is a basis for behavioral safety which is another big up and coming thing that in my world is um, gaining a lot of traction it's that behavior within the work environment of the employees okay so let's talk a little bit about other costs or direct costs. A few years ago, uh, about two to five years ago, OSHA did update their uh, penalties for citations, okay? And one thing I want you to understand is if you have a facility in one state and then you got a facility in another state, let's say your facility was cited in another state, okay? And then they came to inspect your facility in a different state and then they cited you in a different state as well well that could be considered a willful or a repeated violation even though they're in two different states it could be a repeat because it, they're looking at the organization as a whole okay and again penalties are going to be uh, dependent on the circumstance as well but just to give you an idea here are some of the penalties um, that OSHA ha can issue or the state can issue. And on the environmental side, okay, 
within the hazardous waste program this is not an all-encompassing list either but i pulled some that maybe are more typical within uh, laboratory settings or other settings uh, for folks who would be on this call here and oftentimes what i've found is some people who don't recognize they're creating or have hazardous waste especially if they're mixing a lot of different chemicals for a plethora of reasons what they'll try to do is they'll try to treat that waste so that they can on site so that they can um, avoid taking it off site so there's a penalty for that and it could be up to fifty thousand dollars per day okay another one is transporting your hazardous waste off-site without a manifest and even bigger having people sign that manifest that aren't properly trained okay in the land of hazardous waste there's various rigorous training that people need to go through and to stay current on to sign that manifest all right and one thing I want to really drive home to you guys is in the land and in the world of hazardous waste, it's cradle to grave. So a generator is responsible for their waste from the time of inception cradle all the way to the grave. OK, and if that place that you shipped your hazardous waste off site to that was permitted and if they have an issue down the road, you could be responsible for that so that's just something to keep in mind cradle to grave when it comes to hazardous waste uh, clean water act this is another area again not all encompassing list of all uh, violations but more applicable to some of the folks on this call who are in laboratory settings or r d settings uh, a direct discharge could be you know you're directly discharging to a surface water of the state and I got to tell you, folks, they have gone back and forth defining what a surface water of the state is, and it is very, very complicated on how they defined it. But the, my main point is, um, if you're directly discharging to a surface water of the state, you know, do you know where all of your site um, sewer systems or your site dry wells are going? Are they connected to a pipe that directly goes to a surface water of the state? Uh, lo and behold, folks, there are still some people that are discharging oils, okay, into street drains of some sort. In fact, not long ago, there was a fast food restaurant that instructed their employees, hey, just go dump your oil in the street right across the street, okay? Uh, for those who are working with their wastewater treatment plant, okay, you might have um, some sort of uh, permit with them. So if you discharge a constituent that's outside of that permit, you can have a penalty for that. Or if you discharge something that causes the treatment plant to be outside of their permit, that can also be a penalty as well. Okay, uh, Clean Air Act. Um, fines for this one was you know again dependent on what it is and not an all-encompassing list here but they really vary depending on what the circumstances and what they were admitting one thing to really keep in mind here is we've got a really major problem with ozone within our own area for a lot of reasons and in fact there are um a lot of we've been in non-attainment for quite some time from federal regulations so our area is really experiencing and having a heck of a time with ozone but there are still facilities out there who uh, don't recognize that some of their machines or some of their equipment house or require some sort of um chemical that has you know ozone that is released into the ozone um and whatnot so things to just keep in mind i put asbestos here no we shouldn't really be seeing a lot of asbestos but what a lot of people don't grasp either is yes asbestos has been banned over the years but what they don't really think about either is if you're uh, demoing your building or if you're retrofitting your building too, um, building materials could still have some asbestos in it, believe it or not. If not asbestos, they could have some other form of crystalline silica. Okay, maybe some of you have heard that term. 
So if you're disturbing some sort of asbestos within a building, uh, you could be in violation of that. So something to just be aware of, which is why it's really important before you go demo your facility that you ensure that your facility has been um, inspected for asbestos as well. Okay, back to shipping um, hazardous materials and dangerous goods. As I mentioned, there were three modes of transportation and folks, I got to tell you, they some boats that are uh, carrying batteries still are catching on fire, believe it or not, from batteries. So that's been a big thing. And another thing to keep in mind too is um, some of your shipping. Again, some of those can go on passenger planes, okay, depending on what you're shipping. The, that goes into the land of dangerous goods. And there's a whole different set of regulations in addition to FFA that need to be followed when you're shipping those kind of things, okay? So just kind of keep those things in mind as, as you're shipping those type of different things, materials, equipment, or whatnot. And one thing to really keep in mind too is that these penalties may not be encompassing other penalties, right? So uh, the shipping company or the air company or other local municipalities, um, you know, we're starting to hear a lot of derailment from um, the railroad systems, right? When there's spills of some sort, you know, there could be local municipality fines for that or federal fines from that as well. So just to give you a quick just to give you an understanding of there's different penalties that could be embedded within uh, these ones as well. Okay. All right. So let's talk about risk for a bit. Okay. So we just got done with a global pandemic. Let's hope another one is not on the horizon, but we all experience, um, you know, supply chain issues, right? So not only a global pandemic, we're starting to see hurricanes come to the West Coast for goodness sake, or we're having wildfires that are really inundating our air quality as well. So there's inherent risk within all of those things, right? And we are living in such innovation, innovative times right now. So we really have to be adapted to changing in order for us to survive. But a lot of what um, risk enterprise or enterprise risk management has defined risk to be, um, you know, a process or a potential events that affect the organization, right? So a lot of risk is what is your risk appetite? Um, other organizations like ISO or ANSI standards that um, health and safety professionals use as well, they define risk similarly, but a little bit different. Again, it's just that, that business risk, it's that all encompassing um, aspect of your business. So one way to sort of think about it too is just this whole encompassing of creation and protection of value. Okay, what is your value within your organization? And organizations should um, sit down and define what that value is, define what their risk tolerance or your risk appetite is. So in my world, really what I'm looking at or what we're trying to go after is what is the likelihood and severity? Okay, so people will often ask me, Adrian, how safe is that? Or how dangerous is that over there? And I'm gonna come back and say, What's your risk? What's the risk involved with it? So really it's just a numerical um, score to help organizations understand what's the likelihood and what is the severity embedded within the hazards of a job or a task. And each organization uh, should define that for themselves, okay? What presentation wouldn't be complete without regulations, all right? So yes, we are regulated all the way from the federal all the way down to local municipalities, okay? And in the land of um, federal regulations, states are to adopt federal or be as stringent as federal regulations, or they can be more stringent. Um, we like to see and other states have taken upon themselves to be a bit more stringent. We see that in California. We see that in Oregon, Washington, other states. So they can be more in, uh, stringent than federal regulations. But one thing to 
keep in mind too is local fire departments too may have some requirements not only from a sprinkler or fire aspect but also wanting to know um, you know what are chemicals that they have on on your site so they want to have a decent idea of what they're getting themselves into in the event of a fire uh, also working you know what city are you in what treatment plant is that um, treatment plant in so again they may have some local municipality uh, regulations that um, could be applicable to your uh, business as well when it comes to the environmental stuff too, okay? So most people are going to fall within the general industry of OSHA regulations, but OSHA really uh, regulates kind of four main categories, in general industry, construction, agriculture, and maritime, okay? A lot of industries are going to be classified under general industry you know that's your r d uh, nonprofits. those are also going to be manufacturing it's sort of like this all encompassing too um, but, but be aware even though you may be within a general industry if you're engaging in some sort of construction or if your employees are can engaging in some sort of construction activities you can be cited under construction regulations we're starting to see a lot of litigations and cases that are um, in that process too okay from the environmental side again not an all-encompassing list but you've got air programs air pollution controls uh your super funds emergency planning community right to know that's your surplus that's going back to your hazardous waste or storing uh, large quantities of chemicals on your site too so um, maybe some of your facilities have x-ray machines or lasers that deal with radiation so there are regulations um, pertaining to that okay hopefully I didn't rain too much on your Cheerios all right and and if you're feeling this way take a deep breath we'll get through this one okay so let's talk about a starting point for you now that i rained on your cheerios and you're thinking oh my god adrian i got a lot of stuff to do where do where do i even begin okay one thing is that i suggest to a lot of organizations is start an ehs steering committee okay some states require organizations to have a safety committee a lot of people like to call it a safety committee it doesn't have to be called a safety committee it doesn't have to be a ton of people on it but establishing a safety committee really helps organizations just kind of divvy up that um, environmental health and safety stuff among their people. And also when you have folks who are together in terms of from varying different um, places within the organization, you know, folks on the floor, management, leadership, when they're all coming together, um, it takes the onerous off of just one person, okay? It also demonstrates to employees when a steering committee is established and they have that authority or they've been empowered to, uh, you know, drive certain things or make those decisions within the company. Um, it shows employees that the organization is really caring about their employees, okay? Another thing to keep in mind is evaluate your jobs and um, associated tasks all right what are those hazards that are involved with those tasks really understand your risks okay identify acknowledge what those risks are that are embedded within those job tasks uh, involve your employees ask for their feedback ask for their uh, suggestions um, some of the low-hanging fruit that i see are postings so your osha logs for those organizations that have 10 employees and more uh, you do need to be posting your osha 300 logs your osha 300a logs in the facility um, oftentimes i see people forget to do that and again it's just one of those low-hanging fruits there if you are cited by the state or osha those those citations also need to be posted as well uh, labels uh, especially for those chemicals that are in secondary containments um it's those are again just some of those low hanging fruits uh, not only chemical labeling but also are your exits labeled are your fire extinguishers extinguishers labeled as well so some of those just low hanging fruits okay so a quick few seconds on what's on the horizon uh, as i mentioned osha is getting ready to establish some health 
excuse me, some heat illness and injury standards. They're in the beginning phases of that. But while they are working on that, they've also issued a national emphasis program for that. And that really just allows the agency uh, kind of a focus and what they're looking for when they come in into your facility. Uh, the state of Arizona has also issued a state emphasis for um, heat illness and injury as well. Okay, so these are just some of the things that are coming up on the horizon. Okay, so in conclusion, when you have a written program and you have your standard operating procedures identified and written, it really helps to drive that um, trust between your employees and it really shows that you really are understanding what those employees are exposed to and you have a plan in place to help them. Um, mitigate your risks. Understand what those risks are. Start there. I mean, yes, especially when you're starting out, you could be very overwhelmed and thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know where to go. How do I even start? Start with your risks. What are your high risks? What are your high hazards that um, have high risks to them? And when you have employees that are they feel good about their job they feel like they're they can trust their employer they feel like they can speak up within their organization they're going to bring their all and then some okay <sighs> take a deep breath and i leave you with this folks i appreciate your time thank you so much for having me here dylan joan az bio Thank you. And that concludes my presentation. I got two minutes left for some questions. Thank you very much, Adrian. You know, that definitely can really see the scope that is really involved and really how important it is to yeah, make sure that you get on this early and keep things organized. Yes. We have a question, Robin. Yeah, I've, I've got one one question. First of all, you did a great presentation. I teach a course in uh, uh, lab safety on campus, and uh, yes. he covered everything uh, very well. Uh, Thank you. One, one thing I'm curious about, though, there are several uh, uh, companies that do hazardous waste hauling and removal, and uh, what's the experience been like with with startups working with these companies i this is sort of a you know i'm aware of these guys but i've not worked with them and so i'm I'm just curious is it uh like the wild west out there are there certain companies we should be avoiding or, or gravitating towards or something like that sure no that's a really good question robin i appreciate that question and in fact um, a lot of good organizations out there um, you can have really large ones and really small ones too um, my experience i have had where uh, a lot of companies startups what they'll do is um, they don't have somebody on site or or someone like me working with them so um, they don't really know what their hazardous waste is so they rely heavily on the company that they are transporting their waste off site and unfortunately, um, yes, you can rely on them and have them as a collaborative partner, but you as a generator are still responsible for that. And in fact, I had an experience where uh, one company did that. They relied heavily on the, the company and the company was really good at upselling a lot of their stuff too. And what ended up happening was the company um, told the, the hazardous waste company told them, hey, this is hazardous waste and you need to uh, you need to dispose of it it's hazardous waste and when i got on site and we went through the whole motions of no this is not hazardous waste and here's the documentation on why it's not hazardous waste and here's the process that we went through therefore this is no longer hazardous waste i mean why did you even think it was hazardous waste but a plethora of reasons so um be careful relying so heavily on your hazardous waste transportation services is more what i'm coming at yeah is it well anyway thank you you're welcome robin good question thank you for the question yes thank you and joan did mention that az bio members have access to special programs mm -hmm. from clean harbors so i think that could be very useful as well mm -hmm. last question that i had uh so so say i am a small business Mm -hmm. I rent space in a building or I've shared lab space. What is my responsibility as a waste generator or 
really in, in general with EHS compared to my landlord? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a real good one. Um, landlord, see, this is this is the gray area, right? Landlords got um, insurances too. A lot of insurances want to understand the risk that they that not only the facility or the people within the building, um, but you as a generator, you still have that responsibility, that cradle to grave, right? So you as a generator are still going to uh, be responsible for that. Um, I haven't seen anything in my career as of yet, knock on wood, um, some sort of uh, landlord getting um, fined by that, but doesn't mean that they may not in the future. Okay. So I think it's just a partnership and really understanding uh, the landlord also needs to understand too, what type of hazards, especially from a waste side, um, how hazardous are the materials? How are they housing it? Um, this, so forth. So I think both in depending on the circumstance or the situation, the landlord could be cited too. the generator could be cited as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And I think that brings us uh, right about time. So if there are any uh, parting thoughts, Adrian? Yes. It's not rocket science. I mean, lo and behold, it feels like a lot. It seems like a lot. You don't have to bite off a lot all at once. Take that time, understand what your what the tasks are, understand what those hazards are. Um, I am able to help organizations um, start with their implementing their program, help them get up and going, help them with establishing their risk and risk management and things like that. It is doable. And lo and behold, I appreciate the time, the effort. Thank you so much for listening to me. And hopefully you didn't fall asleep while I was moving quickly through my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sure everyone was yeah, definitely engaged. <laughs> thank you. And reach out anytime if I can be of any assistance or answer any questions. Thank you so much.